So welcome everybody on Instagram and everybody on Zoom to our second of who knows how many interactive days. They got signed up for too many of these. About uh, about about 200 of you joined us last uh, last week for tasting Cabernet, and uh, apparently we didn't uh, didn't scare you off. Uh, we couldn't couldn't believe it. And frankly, more of you have signed up on Zoom for this tasting. Uh, then you're not all relatives. Yeah, it's just incredible. <laughs> actually, we bribed half the people last. We're very excited. So many of you uh, uh, from all over the country have tuned in. Our old friends. Uh, um, uh, people in the trade, it's really, uh, it's been fun and they see all your questions, all your feedback, it's really been, really been awesome. Yeah. I think one of the coolest things for me, Dad, when, uh, when we kind of did our little breakdown afterwards and we got to see all the comments that you guys were leaving uh, in chat and, and through the Q&A and on Instagram um, was where everyone, everybody was coming from. Uh, and so it was from all over the country, Fort Worth all the way up to Northern Minnesota, up into New England. Uh, so and, and they can chat amongst themselves, right? So. They can talk to each other. Yes. Yeah. You know, social distancing is real easy. On Instagram, right? <laughs> you, know, you get you get that distance automatically. Um, as I said, this is the second in a, a couple, uh, just the two tastings we've done so far. Um, we are going to get ready to taste some Sauvignon Blanc today. Last week we did Cabernet Sauvignon. And First of all, who are we? We have many have people tuning in here. You know? Who don't know who we are? That's yeah. True. I'm John Williams, owner and winemaker of Frog Blanc. I'm Rory Williams, owner and winemaker of Frog's Leaf Wineries. Oh, good. And this winery is too big for the two of us. Um, like I said, we're going to taste a little bit of Sauvignon Blanc today. And, uh, you know, as we go through these May wines, uh, yeah, you yeah. can start We can start pouring that out. Um, I just want to remind everybody on Zoom especially, um, I've got the Q&A lined up right in front of me. Um, and we'll be taking questions and we'll be pausing periodically to try to answer those questions for you, um, uh, quite, whether they're questions for me, questions for my dad, questions about uh, where you can get the wines and things like that. Um, I have no idea. I don't, I don't sell these wines. You know. and, and one of the questions we had last week was which one of us is younger. And so I think we should clear that up. Right? <laughs> clear that up right? It's hard for people. Well, the beard length indicates uh, age and wisdom, as, you can, as I'm sure you can tell. Um, so without too much further ado, Maybe we step right into it. And uh, we've got, you know, we've got our 2018 Sauvignon Blanc and our 2018 Rachel Rossi Reserve Sauvignon Blanc that we are kind of, you know, scheduled to taste today, but absolutely don't. Uh, uh, if you've got the 2017 or whatever Frog's Leaf wine you've got in front of you, we just kind of want to share, uh, you know, some of what we know, some of what we think we know, oh and some of the God. stuff we, we, uh, we, we tell people we know, but we don't actually know about Sauvignon Blanc, uh, which turns out to be a pretty large category of these. Uh, it is. Uh, it's become a really popular variety. Uh, we've been making it a long time in Frog Sleep, and in fact, uh, uh, this vintage, uh, believe it or not, will be our 40th uh, vintage. The uh, 2020 will be our 40th vintage of uh, Frog Sleep Sauvignon Blanc. It really has been the wine that is the fabric of our winery in so many ways. I, I don't know that everyone realizes, but uh, 50% uh, of the production at Frog Sleep is white wine, and 50% is red wine. And so between the, the uh, little bit of Chenin Blanc and the Chardonnay and the Sauvignon Blanc, which is our uh, biggest category of wine, uh, this is a, a really important wine to us. And, uh, and just, we love it. We absolutely love it. It's been uh, a big part of what we've been doing for all these years. You know, for me out in the vineyards, it's also the, uh, it's one of the grapes that buds out in the spring. They've got a little bit of Sauvignon Blanc starting to bud out. We've been right up here. a few nights with Frost already. <laughs> we've been up with Frost already, uh, three nights in a row this week. Um, and it's one of the first, usually the first variety that comes in and is harvested in the fall. And so it's always kind of the, the grape that, that kicks you in the pants and says, hey, time to, time to get going, time to make some wine. And so it's the wine that we often push in the start of harvest with. And uh, so it's got a, it, you know, besides being a part of the, the Frog's Leap uh, you know, brand, part of our identity and part of who we are, uh, for so long. It just, it's what gets us excited every single year. And it's one of the great white wine, great wines of the world. I mean, we, look, we all know the old canard that there's only two times to drink red wine when you're fishing and when you're not fishing. And I think that as that's been repeated over the years, people tend to devalue white wines and think that uh, red wine is what it's all about. But man, there's just so many times when a great bottle of white wine, I'm starting to drink more white wine all the time. I really uh, to me, uh, you know, I may actually enjoy making white wine more than I do making red. 
and, and I want you to, you said that, Dad, you said that multiple times over the course of, you know, my life is uh, often you get more excited about making wine. And I think I understand a little bit of what you mean by that, but I'm, I'm curious to hear it from, from your perspective, you know, kind of out loud, you know, wh why you think, you know, sometimes, why, I agree, sometimes white winemaking can be a little bit more, can be a little more exciting, it can be a little more challenging. But I want to hear it from you. Well, I, you know, look, I cut my teeth in upstate New York making Riesling. And, and, the, and the beauty to me of white wines is this incredible sense of balance, the acidity balance. And I think that that's just always been intriguing to me. I think actually something you brought up at a winery is a little bit more of a sense of the textural quality, which is much more important than red wines. To me, in white wines, the, the aspect of the reductive capacity of the wine and, and then the acidic balance are just so cool. And because you know, white wine is so transparent, it, making it is almost like a zen-like experience. You, the flaws are easily, easily evident and, and you're highly rewarded by doing less. And, and I think in so many things, doing less sounds like it would be the easier thing to do, but I think in any study we know that doing less, it takes more effort than doing more, and particularly with wine. Well, and I think it kind of leads into, you know, the idea of just doing less with wine. I mean, obviously there's a, there's a lower limit on that. I mean, we do have to pick the grapes and put them into a tank and all that. But, but, but I think you're right, Dad, that there's a little bit of the uh, uh, a letting go with wine making sometimes that you've got to, it has to be a part of what you do. Um, I've so, actually so, we, so we, we grow this Sauvignon Blanc in our vineyards in Rutherford, but Rutherford is the most famous place for Cabernet Sauvignon in the world. Why would we not just grow more carrot? I want to hear this from you. <laughs> <laughs> and your person. Um, and your person. <laughs> well, honestly, Dad, I think it ties in a little bit into why, uh, you know, why Sauvignon Blanc in the first place. Well, lar a large majority of the Sauvignon Blanc uh, that comes into our winery, we grow, and we grow here, right here in Rutherford. Um, and like you said, you know, Rutherford's extremely famous for Cabernet Sauvignon. Why wouldn't you just plant Cabernet Sauvignon anywhere? And you know, to, we'll, we'll kind of take a step back a little bit and just talk a tiny bit about Napa Valley geology. Well, I won't go into too much detail, but Napa is this north-south valley defined by these alluvial fans that come out of the hills um, and have defined the, the, the geomorphology of Napa. For alluvial fans being gravelly deposits? Exactly. So these are, these are fan-looking fan uh, formations where you have lots of gravel and these kinds of uh, well-drained soils coming out of the hills. Um, and that's what really defines in the center of those uh, gravelly alluvial fans, you've got the great ground for Cabernet. That's you know, where we grow our Cabernet. Between those alluvial fans and at the edges of those alluvial fans, you have this kind of interaction. And, and in the center of the valley in the soil. Exactly. Right. You don't, not every piece of soil in Napa is an alluvial fan. And not every piece of soil in the Napa Valley, including Rutherford, including decent, decent chunks of Rutherford, not, uh, there are pieces of Rutherford that are not appropriate for Cabernet Sauvignon. And they are great for Sauvignon Blanc. And a lot of that has to do with how well these grapes ripen in a particular, in a particular soil. And you, know, you talk about doing less, about the stepping back from that. That's all set up by doing the, uh, doing the right thing, when planting the grapes in the right place. So you can make more money growing bad Cabernet than you can grapes up. Well, yeah, we've never been real good at making money. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> I'm curious to that. <laughs> so talk, tell me about this wine. It's a 2018 Sauvignon Blanc, um, just really mm. coming into its own right now. Really, really delicious. Um, this has got that, that beautiful kind of lemony uh, character that we love in the Sauvignon Blanc. But, you know, and this is something we've uh, struggled for for a long time is that kind of a little bit of that minerality in there as well. And that's, I mean, I don't know about you, but that's what I love about Sauvignon, Sauvignon Blanc is it has this balance between the lemony and this brightness and freshness and lift and acidity, but then it has this kind of savory mineral aspect to it as well. It's fun to taste it. We've been bottling, as you know, the 19 all week and so getting it ready for sale. and. Uh, so I've been tasting it a lot. And, uh, you know, the, the Sauvignon Blancs in the spring, just before they're bottled, are so almost grapefruity and really fresh and, mm -hmm. and so on. And so by uh, coming back to this, now that it's starting to put on a smoking jacket a little bit and be a bit proper, it's really kind of fun to see how much more mature, even in a year, this, this wine really is. Yeah, it's, it's exciting. So I encourage everybody to taste this. And we'll maybe pause here to just take a couple of questions. Um, 
from Edward, what foods pair well with frog sleep Sauvignon Blanc? Lots of stuff. Um, it's, uh, you know, I had a, a dish just the other day with, uh, with Sauvignon Blanc. It was uh, uh, ricotta cheese with mint and with lemon all mixed, you know, kind of whipped into the ricotta cheese right on top of the cracker. And that was, uh, you know, just kind of a simple, simple dish. In general, things that have a little bit of bite to them themselves, goat cheeses and things like that, go extremely well with Sauvignon Blanc. I think with cheese in general, I, th I think I almost always have white wine with cheese. You, there's a, a, a thought that, you know, bring out your, your Burgundy or your Bordeaux to go with cheese. I, I think white wine is really the cheese cheese wine. And so, you know, often when we have uh, dinner, we'll, we'll go through our red wines. But when the cheese comes out, it, it, we go back to white wine. Um, another question, why, could we comment on screw caps? Which varietals would you use them on and why? And you can notice the 2018 was actually the first wine that we ever put a screw cap on. We bought a screw capper specifically for this wine. And I think a lot of this has to tie into when we talk about freshness with Sauvignon Blanc and trying to preserve that freshness. The screw cap gives us kind of our best opportunity at really enhancing that freshness and, and preserving it down the line without the um, what we were finding to be kind of uh, variability in cork that we uh, didn't necessarily find pleasurable. It's just man, the, the, if you ever want to engage a wine maker and uh, and you don't know what to say to them, you can either go with one subject or other. Have you solved your label problem yet, or what are you doing about closures? Because they, they are the angst, these seemingly innocent things in winemaking that can have a huge effect, and and we've struggled for years with obviously the cork is a great closure for wine but corks fail from time to time they get tca they get they, they get a, a bad smell and so uh you know i think uh, particularly with white wines uh, screw caps have become more and more acceptable and actually in many cases we're finding in the trade particularly uh, preferable and uh, I, I don't know that we've really had to adapt our wine making it uh, at all with respect to the screw cap. So when this screw, is new. This is the first wine with it. First, fine, first wine with it. When screw caps first came out, there were some issues with the wines almost being uh, frozen in time, not developing over time. And the technology in screw caps has, has evolved to the point where um, that doesn't happen anymore. Where you do have an evolution of the wine, you just have a more consistent, more, uh, more steady evolution of the wine. The flip side of that is that we don't know what that end point is, not yet. Um, we are happy with uh, this wine. I think this one's incredibly fresh. Yeah, just, lovely. just, you know, really what, where we would hope this wine would be at this point in its development. I think it may be something you can do amongst yourselves if you're out there and chat back and forth. What, what is your, uh, do you still feel there's any stigma associated particularly with white wines with a uh, screw cap or are they becoming um, acceptable um, uh, in mainstream. I think it'd be, we'd love to hear your opinions on those matters. Yeah. I know some people miss the cork. Uh, and it's, it's interesting. It's to hard know. to say ribbit on the screw cap. It's it, part it's of the problem. Yeah. <laughs> well, we tried to do that, but it would cost extra. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, many of you will notice there, we do have a cork on the, on the other wine we have up here, the Rachel Rossi. And a lot of that ties into kind of what the intention is with where, when we want to be drinking this wine. And we know that with, the Rachel that there's we want to be drinking this wine for much much longer there's the there's the intent that it would go for longer in bottle and so cork we have a little bit more of a, tra uh, a track record in terms of how it performs long term but this is something that you know wineries make changes uh, all over the world we have, we adapt we evolve we're not frozen in time um, and so we innovation 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 if you're not learning and improving your wines you might as well just pull up the ship, you know, yeah. it's, it's not good. And so that's kind of, I, I guess, the, the basic rundown of, of why one closure on, on one wine versus another. It's sort of our best guess at, you know, when that wine is most likely to be open by you, uh, by at home, for a, for a meal. We, we almost feel a responsibility that that wine be good for you, for you guys. We, we don't want it to be a situation where you're worried about it being over the hill or corked or, or uh, difficult to open or and so we're making our kind of best guess to how to get that wine into its, uh, you know into its best position for you well just a, 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 a little toast to you guys with the Sauvignon Blanc um, we just love this wine it's such a huge part of, of Frog's Leaf we love everything about it we treat it with 
so much respect. I, I, you know, I tell the story often that my very first trip to France many, many years ago, I had a chance to go in the uh, early 80s to uh, Sancerre, the, the spiritual home of, of Sauvignon Blanc in the Loire Valley in France. And to see the respect that people had for this variety there, how they had developed cuisine around it, how they wouldn't drink anything else other than their Sauvignon Blancs, the beauty of these wines, the freshness of them, uh, the, this trip to La Recette, man, where, which we repeated the, this last spring, we went to visit the La Recette, this fairyland castle and these beautiful vineyards. And, and uh, it was such an impression on me as a young winemaker that I vowed that this variety, as long as I was making it, would get as much or more respect than any other variety that we do. And I think sometimes there's a sense in winemaking that, oh, Cabernet, and you put all your emphasis on that. That's just not the case of Project. We love this wine. We give it all the respect. And we drink it probably more often than we do Cabernet. So, you know, <laughs> well, we, we drink a fair amount. We kind of drink a lot of wine in this family. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't think that's a flaw. Um, so again, anyway, uh, so what else we got here? I think maybe we'll go on to the second wine here. And I think that'll help us kind of explore wh why we love Sauvignon Blanc and why we uh, why we make what we do. I'm going to keep this wine right now. Are you? Yeah. Right here. So we're next going to pour our Rachel Rossi Sauvignon Blanc, which we very cleverly made a nearly all white label that's very hard to see on, on camera. Uh, but trust us, it's gorgeous, beautiful. This is, um, it's cloudy. <laughs> it is a little cloudy. Um, the Rachel Rossi Sauvignon Blanc is, it's a separate Sauvignon Blanc. And I guess, you know, kind of the one pager on this wine is that this is a separate, uh, separate block that we've just always found special. And it's kind of, a, I, I guess we always reserve the right to have crazy ideas that may or may not work here. This is a toast to you. you. You wouldn't let me take these vines. It's true. No, I, I, I blocked it. Um, and this, this is a, a little block of uh, Sauvignon Blanc over at the, the Rossi Vineyard uh, that is sitting on some of the best Cabernet so, soil in the world, I would imagine. You, you, easy to say, right? And uh, But these vines were planted in 1981, the very year that we uh, started Frog Sleep. And so these vines have been in the ground for as long as we've been a winery, which is kind of exceptional. We were going to take them out to plant Cabernet Sauvignon, you, you, you would not have any of it. This, this is something, um, and you know, this, uh, the Rachel Rossi, so why Rachel Rossi? This is uh, named after the Rossi Ranch. So this is uh, one of our um, primary estate ranches. It's actually right next to where my dad and I live. Um, and we don't live together, but no, no, we do. <laughs> this vineyard's between us. I'm, well, I'm in your basement these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so this, was making that noise. Then. <laughs> so Rachel Rossi was the matriarch of the uh, of the Rossi uh, property and Rossi winery going all the way back uh, to Prohibition. And so there was on the property there is before a, that they started their winery in 1908. 1908. Yeah. So this is. Um, for us, and still there's a, the, the name factor is on the side of the old winery at Rossi, uh, really right next to these vines where they're planted. And it's kind of our little tribute to, I guess what you might call the agricultural fortitude of, of, uh, of Rachel Rossi. I think and some we, pictures of this vine. We do. We do. We so actually, up. I yeah. think uh, we'll-, we'll uh, Our production staff is hard working hard behind us. So they're gonna throw up a photo of uh, some of the vines that, are, that grow at Rachel. Uh, in this little block. And, you know, like my dad said, these are old vines uh, planted, uh, planted 40, almost 40 years ago at this point. And they get, they turn into these extremely gnarled, beautiful vines. You can see it there. Um, this is a uh, Sauvignon Blanc when it gets big and when it gets a little bit older, uh, you know, you can see the, the gnarled, twisted arms going up. Um, you can see some of the fruit. I think this is taken sometime in July, it looks like. And you can see it's all, it, it looks a little bit chaotic and that's sort of the beauty of the Rachel is that it's, it's not, uh, not meticulously, uh, you know, kind of ordered and rowed and, and, and definitely not made for, for modern day mechanization. This is sort of a product of a bygone age in, in Napa Valley. And it's uh, our joy to, uh, to, to farm these and to be able to, to work with them. It's really a, a, a really tiny block um, that we just, Love working with. Um, I think it was uh, also uh, fun to name this after Rachel Rossi. I mean, we 
you know, so many, so many of the great winemakers in modern times are women, uh, you know, uh, and, and so we don't even think about this. We think this is a relatively um, a recent phenomenon, but here's Rachel Rossi started the, uh, her family's winery in 1908, uh, had three children, and her husband uh, died when uh, he was 26 years old. They already had three children. So uh, she took over uh, the farm. Her kids started working with them. They ran it all the way through Prohibition. There's actually an underground pipe through the vineyard out there. She bootlegged all the way through Prohibition to keep her family going. Her son took over as winemaker. Uh, and they ran it as a winery there until 1949 when actually her son passed away. And, uh, and uh, uh, they closed down the winery. And, uh, but here's this woman who keeping her family together, growing these grapes on this beautiful farm. And, uh, and, and they ran it all the way until 2007 when her daughter, uh, Louise, uh, passed away and left us the chance to, to buy the vineyard. So this is a tribute to also, I think, all the strong and beautiful women in our lives. So, yeah. Um, Rachel that. Rossi. Is this a, um, so how do we make this? Why is, how's this different? Yeah, so, you know, how do we kind of come to, to, to separate this out? Um, and why do we make it differently? How do we make it differently? This, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but I always remember when we would go through and sample these grapes, you can, you can even taste the difference in the, in the raw grapes themselves. They just have this different kind of aroma, different kind of flavor to them when you're out there tasting them during harvest, which you know, between my dad and I and Frank Leeds, our longtime viticulturalist and my mentor in the vineyards, um, we we sample pretty much everything we make ourselves, no interns. Um, and whenever one of us would go out there and sample this small block of Sauvignon Blanc, we'd come back and say, man, that that block, the old cane or the Rachel, the Rachel cane block is just, just tasting incredible right now. It's got this, uh, and it always has had this extra little bit of an, if I had to put a name on it, a little bit of tropicality to it, which normally is something you get when you leave something you walk on the vine way too long. It gets these kind of pineapple and guava aromas. And, mm. and that usually corresponds to low acidity and high pH and kind of just a little bit of flabbiness in the wine. But what's always made this block really special is it's had that with and combined that with tremendous energy and tremendous lift and tremendous acidity. And so we had the idea of just having a little bit of fun with it. Um, we had been experimenting with concrete tanks uh, for a couple of years. Some of you know some successful experiments and some not. So bad. We don't talk like about the sarcophagi anymore. Uh, we, we, had, we, had some, we had some failed. Uh, uh, you had to bring it up. Yeah, we had to bring up the sarcophagi. <laughs> um, but this is fermented in a concrete egg, um, and I think now if we can put up a photo of the egg, just because I think that's the only real way to describe it other than it being a, an egg-shaped concrete tank. Um, I, th I think one we should know, there's a tradition of these kind of wines in Sancerre in, in the Loire of, of a reserve style of Sauvignon Blanc with greater leaves aging and so on, you know, the big concrete tanks. So it was in the back of my mind anyway, I don't know if it was so much yours, but the idea of a much longer time on the lees. And we were hearing about the, the value of these eggs, which keep the lees in suspension and, and build the body and the richness of the wine, which is so evident in, in this wine. Really. And if you can see the, you can saw the concrete tank there. So, you know, when we talk about doing less with the winemaking, we probably do less with the Rachel than It'd any other. It would be hard to do any less. It would really be wine. actually be quite hard to do any less than we do with the Rachel, which is kind of funny because it's a special wine and it's a special block and it almost requires us to have more, take a more hands-off approach. So you saw the tank, um, the wine, the grapes come in, they're pressed, they're pressed to that tank, they ferment in that tank. Natural yeast. And they just sit there. Uh, and that wine sits there, finished, basically until the next harvest. And it sits in there for almost an entire year uh, before we bottle it. And some of you are asking why the Rachel Rossi is cloudy. It's not really cloudy, but it's got a little, you know, how dare you call it cloudy, yeah. This wine is not filtered. This wine is bottled straight from the tank. Um, we take it out of the tank. We just give it an overnight settle, and then it goes straight into bottle. Um, that's unique among Frog Lake wines at this point. You may have skipped that. I don't know. Maybe I wasn't listening, as I usually don't. But I mean, um, this is a full year on the leaves before it's bottled. So we bottle it right before we pick the grapes the next year. And exactly. so it's been sitting on its fermentation leaves for an entire year. And that's where this beautiful mouthfeel. And, and I think what's 
that we make less than 100 cases of this wine and we drink most of it ourselves, okay? So and we're glad you're sharing it with us today. But uh, this is really a, a wine for us to learn as much as it is anything else. And it's highly influenced the way we think about our, 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 um, our Rutherford Sauvignon Blanc. Our, our regular bottling of Sauvignon Blanc. I think that's absolutely right. It's, it's interesting. There are, you know, given the differences between these two wines, which, you know, to sum up, uh, our regular Sauvignon Blanc is coming from usually some clay rich soils, um, soils that are kind of on the margin of these gravel rich, which are uh, not exactly opposite, but you know, considerably different soils. It'll be gravel rich or clay rich. Most of our Cabernets and all of our Cabernets in gravel rich soil. And most of our Sauvignon Blanc is in clay rich soil or very deep and very, very fertile soil. Um, once the Sauvignon Blanc comes into the, the, most of our Sauvignon Blanc comes into the winery, it's fermented in stainless steel, not concrete, and is held in tank. And we are just now, uh, right outside this room, uh, we've got our bottling line ready to go to start up on Monday uh, to continue bottling our 2019 Sauvignon Blanc. So it spends about, you know, four to five months on, on the lees. Uh, well, we used to never do it that long. It used to be, man, we clean it up pretty much I'm, right after. I'm getting oh, you are. Okay, we're going to speed it up a little bit. Getting, getting, I, got, I got it. Oh, okay. um, so the regular Sauvignon Blanc, four to five months on the lees, you know, getting some of that richness, as opposed to the Rachel, which is in these, is in Cabernet soil. It's in gravel rich soil, so completely different soil type that gives it that kind of a little bit more of that perfume and a little more, more of that high tone character, a little bit different than uh, kind of steers away from the lemony a little bit and gets into more of a kind of savory rich, uh, but a big difference with this is how it's fermented. And we mentioned the egg. So it's not, the Rachel is not fermented in stainless steel. It's just in the concrete. It's the only vessel that this wine is fermented in and held on the lees for all that time. And what's interesting about it is we don't stir the lees. Um, you know, that's, that's known as batonnage in, in French or lees stirring. It's very common with Chardonnay. We don't do any lees stirring whatsoever in our Chardonnay or in our- uh, Well, Sunday. we say that except that the, something about aging in concrete seems to keep the lees in suspension. So we're almost getting like an anaerobic or an interior batonnage. And uh, you can see that it's impossible to clarify the wine in these tanks. Yes. It doesn't settle out at all. So you can, we can go over to the egg right now, which is currently holding the 2019 uh, Rachel Rossi. And even though it's been sitting there for several months now, you can take a sample off the top of that tank and it'll appear cloudy. There's a little bit of lees still stirring in there. The thing about manually stirring lees is you've got to open the top, that lets oxygen in, and you've got this kind of very violent stirring, very violent mixing of the, of the, uh, of the lees mixture. And that just gives you a different kind of approach. It really amps up the richness and amps up the kind of that, uh, yeah, just that kind of not quite buttery, but that o o super rich kind of character, which sounds like, hey, that's what you want, right? You want more super richness in the wine. But for us, Without Frog's Leap, us, yeah. for us at Frog's Leap, it's always been about just, you know, taking a step back from that and asking, is that really what we want? I think that the thing that I love the best about the Rachel is that over time, over that nine, 10, 11, 12 months in this concrete egg, it develops that richness naturally. It's not from us stirring anything in, it's not from us adding anything in, it's not from us putting it in an oak barrel, um, which none it's of almost the opposite, it's from doing less. It's from yeah. doing less. Yeah. And we've taken that to heart with the making of our regular Sauvignon Blanc, which now sees more time. This is the latest we've bottled the Sauvignon Blanc in years, actually. Yeah. And that is a direct result of kind of what we've learned from the Rachel, which is that, man, um, hey, you know, what if we leave this just a little bit longer, push it a little bit longer? So what does it mean to be a reserve? Uh, <laughs> you know, I think the, uh, why Rachel Rossi reserve? And I think that uh, it's, a, it's a word that's been bandied around in the wine industry and probably devalued because there's no actual legal definition of what reserve means. For us, it means that these are vines uh, reserved for making this special wine. Uh, it is uh, aged uh, on its lease for an entire year. And then we didn't mention, we just released this 18 Sauvignon Blanc. So it's had a full year in the bottle to mature as well. And so I think in the true spirit of what it means to be a wine reserved for later enjoyment in every sense of the word. You know, we, we did, because we, we kind of sat down and battled about that word a little bit when we, uh, when we were first kind of figuring out, you know, okay, we've got the Rachel Block, do we call it the, the special Rachel wine or the, but we decided that the right word for it was reserved because it's reserved yeah. in tank, it's reserved in bottle um, and held back. 
um, this is the 2018 brand new, um, whereas the 18 uh, regular subway block is kind of at the end of its run here. But this 18, the Rachel is just coming on and just ready for sale now, I think. Um, and really gives it that time to develop the richness and the character. So maybe we'll pause for a couple, just a couple minutes, take a couple questions. That sound good? Yeah. I think the one question I'm seeing coming up is, uh, is it the egg shape that keeps the leaves in suspension or what's going on there? And I think we've got some insight for that that is rather surprising. Actually. It is rather surprising. You know, next, I'll put a little plug in for next week when we talk about Zinfandel. Concrete will figure in with the Zinfandel quite a bit where uh, a large portion of our Zinfandel is now fermented in concrete, or uh, sorry, aged in concrete, not fermented in concrete. Um, and we're noticing some of the same effects with- uh, A lot of the same. A lot of the same effects with Zinfandel in a differently shaped concrete tank in a cube. And so it's, it's sort of a part of the, the mythology of these concrete eggs is that it's this you know, oval shape that allows the leaves to remain in suspension. And we're finding is that it's mostly just the fact that it's concrete and the fact that it's a specific formula uh, formulation of concrete that's there made, some made to be why that happens, right? Some electrostatic uh, or something. You're the research scientist these days. So I never passed the chem, so no, that's it's, yeah. it's a, you know don't really know. But we, what we've noticed empirically is that um, the the lees stay in suspension longer when in contact with the concrete, and that's something that you know. Rather than it doesn't make it taste like concrete, which thank goodness we were actually we're a little worried about that yeah. at first. Um, but instead, it really just allows this kind of natural development uh, of the uh, of the wine. And so, uh, Christian McLaren is asking, "What do you mean when you describe your wine as dry farmed?" Uh, ah, well, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. So, all of our grapes are dry farmed, and what we mean by that is that we do not add any supplemental irrigation to our grapes at all. Um, so that means uh, the rainstorm that we're scheduled to get tonight and uh, and tomorrow, um, we're, we're pretty happy because that's the rain that the vines are going to rely on. Um, and how you know you can say, well, how how does a how does a grapevine make use of rainfall in March uh, when it's you know got its tongue hanging out and is, uh, needs water in the middle of July and during harvest and through the long hot days of September? Well, that's what we're doing right now. That's uh, dry farming is an active verb, uh, not this uh, kind of act of just going out there and turning off the water. If you go out into 90%, 95% uh, of the vineyards in Napa Valley and you turn off the irrigation water, the vines will die. They're not prepared for it. Um, but what we do um, with the way that we farm is all about setting up these vines so that they're ready to receive all of the moisture right now and really interact with the soil around them. And, and really when we talk about dry farming, a lot of it ties into organic farming, and a lot of it ties into just good farming. Healthy pound of soil will hold nine pounds of water. They're gigantic sponges if they're healthy soils, and that's very important. You know, I think this idea of dry farming sounds very radical, oh my God. You know, but I, I want to point out a couple of things. When I got to the Napa Valley in 1975, there were no irrigated vineyards. Every single vineyard in the Napa Valley was dry farmed. All the great and fundamental lines that established the reputation of the Napa Valley, the great Billiers and Angle Nooks and, and the Stag's Leap that won the Paris tasting. I know, I love bottles of that wine, the great Mondavi wines, the Shelta, all these wines were dry farm vineyards. Irrigation wasn't introduced until 1976. And so it has really been the advent of irrigation that is now so popular, as Roy pointed out, easily 95 to 97% of the vineyards now are irrigated sometimes heavily. And we think that that's had a fundamental change. It's also important to note that there, in every other great wine growing region in the world, irrigation is not allowed. And so you think of the great wines of France or Italy or Spain or Portugal or Germany, not allowed to irrigate them except by special dispensation. So we don't think this is a radical concept. We don't think it's difficult to do. And we think it's fundamental, at least to our style of wine and balance and restraint. Um, and, you know, Sorry, I got off on my no, 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 Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Don't so, mess my hair. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, don't mess up my hair either. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm, can't, I can't. Actually, all the places are closed right now. I'll tell you It's a match. <laughs> Put it under the vineyard bell. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and maybe tangentially related to that is uh, there's a question about whether Sauvignon Blanc is drier than the Chardonnay. That's kind of a different meaning of drier, uh, where dry just refers to the sugar sugar content or lack thereof, really, with uh, with Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc. Our Chardonnay and our Sauvignon Blanc are both completely dry. What we mean by that is they have no sugar. 
Um, and that's not even, uh, it means that they don't even have any sneaky sugar, the kind of sugar that you don't really taste as sweet, yeah. but when it gets below a certain percentage of sugar in a wine, you can't really, your, your tongue can't really pick it up as sweet, but instead it'll go, whoa, that kind of, that tastes heavy or rich. Uh -huh. And it's a little uh, sneaky winemaking trick to get, to try to pump in a little extra. Yeah, everyone artificial. likes sweet dry wines. Yeah, sweet yeah. dry wines. So I got a question, how do uh, Sauvignon Blanc age? <laughs> Ooh, that's a good question. That was a segue, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, like last week, we do have older wine here, and I know some of you were wondering well, why do, why uh, why not include the wine with the uh, with the regular tasting package. And with this wine, um, you know, we wanted to kind of throw something out there where we weren't totally sure what it was going to taste like, and, and we, we still aren't. <laughs> we'll take a look at this. We have our 2008 Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and for those of you who are interested in about closures, we actually have an entirely different closure, a Norma cork or a plastic cork in this wine, which we experimented with for a short time um, and ultimately we're, we're a little unsatisfied with. And we wanted to, we wanted to introduce this wine because 2008 and aged Sauvignon Blancs in general require a little bit of an introduction because everybody's pretty familiar with, uh, you know, fresh Sauvignon Blanc for 2018 is a great example. It's just got all this life and, you know, kind of lemony fruitiness and, you know, a tiny bit of the, maybe a tiny bit of the grassy and the grapefruit, not, not heavy like in a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, but, you know, it's, it's kind of what you'd expect uh, in general for Sauvignon Blanc. Aged Sauvignon Blanc is a totally different animal. Um, and this wine, we will have it for sale on, I believe it is for sale now on the website, but I wanted to, we wanted to be able to taste it with you and kind of explain what older Sauvignon Blanc is like. Well, we say it's for sale, there's three cases. <laughs> <laughs> we found him kicking around at the bottom of his desk, you know. <laughs> but, well, listen, I, 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 I'm trying, I don't know what to think. I have not had this wine in a long time, so. And the reason that we wanted to give a little bit of context to this is because this wine, um, how would you describe it, Dad? Well, I, you know, we talked about this with the older red wine last year. When these wines first come out of the bottle, um, this has been a G. This has been in the bottle for, you know, for 10 years now, right? And um, it's got a little mushroomy uh, sense to it. And I think that I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see how this is going to develop over uh, so, the course of my dinner. And I'm taking the rest of this bottle home. With yeah, me. exactly. <laughs> so a wine like the 2008, you know, for oh, me, boy. the description already coming out. The, the, the descriptions of this are less of the kind of lemony fresh fruit and more. This gets into the kind of into that kind of tropical fruit aroma. So this gets a little bit of that pineapple guava kind of character, but it mixes that very importantly with some other terms that you don't really necessarily associate with Sauvignon Blanc, namely things like cheese rind and almond, um, which you kind of think, well, that doesn't sound very pleasant. And it, it's it's mostly just interesting. And we talked a little bit last week about how when wines age, especially Cabernet Sauvignon, that their personality changes. You, you gotta smell this wine, it's really I'm smelling it, I'm smelling it. I'm, I'm describing it right now on camera, you know that, right? Um, and the, the personality of this wine has completely changed to the point, to the point where this is not, no longer a wine I would necessarily just kind of pop pop open on the porch no, no, on a no, hot no, day no, no. And, and put into a tumbler glass and just that's the well-earned glass of Sauvignon Blanc at the end of the day. This is a wine for reflection. It's a wine to have definitely with food. It's a wine that is, you know, just a little bit idiosyncratic with what you expect. Certainly out of, I mean, nobody's aging their Sauvignon Blancs for, uh, for 11 years, 12 years at this point, um, except us, I guess, we're just that uh, just that uh, yeah, you know, the this, this uh, wine reminds me like something from the Jura almost you know, we think that a preparation uh, of food uh, a much more complex dish say a, a chicken with like a mushroom sauce or something like this or uh, a well ripened uh, uh, soft cheese you know uh, yeah. uh, um, a triple creme or something like that this is uh, if, if you if this kind of description sounds interesting to you I we very highly recommend that you try the wine yeah with braised chicken with morel mushrooms, oh, yeah. comte cheese, some uh, walnuts, things like that. Stuff that you wouldn't necessarily be your first thought of with, uh, with Sauvignon Blanc, but it really can go down this interesting path of uh, unfolding really a little piece of history in front of you. You know, um, we were at, um, at uh, in, in Sancerre and we were at La Dessette and they opened 
what were some of the older wines we had there? They were 10 years old. Uh, 2000, 2002 yeah. wine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Delicious. Yeah. yeah. They, Delicious. they really can age and they, but they age differently. They're not the kind of, because they're not the wines that are usually encountered as they age um, and as they go along, um, they require just a little bit of a different mindset. So um, we wanted to just throw that out there as we encourage everybody to try it, but be, care, uh, be aware of what you're in for with there. Yeah. With the wine. Yeah. I think with the, Rachel Rossi, we're hoping it'll actually go that direction. And, you know, from we only really started making it in 2016, but from the, wine, from the wines that we've tried even now after, after just a few years, it is gaining more of that kind of really savory is the word for it, where it's no longer this kind of youthful fruitiness, but instead is really focusing in and bearing down on the minerality of the wine and on these kind of complex spices that you can get out of it. It's really opening up to, it's, it's fun, it's just fun. I was a little worried because the Nova cork, uh, this, you know, we were having so much trouble with uh, cork bottles that I, I experimented with these uh, um, uh, composite corks, not composite, but the, uh, lam uh, what's the proper term for these? Uh, I don't I hate to use plastic, um, but they're, they're um, uh, it's ultimately, I, I'm actually pleased how well the wine is aging because um, these are not, you don't think about these kind of corks as preserving a long lifespan. Which is why we put a long regular cork and a dark bottle on the Rachel Ross Reserve. Is I, I fully expect that wine in ten or fifteen or twenty years to really uh, show the light, and so it's going to be interesting. Yeah, I mean, I mean uh, the Rachel is. Uh, I guess you can think about why you know why the Rachel. Another reason for it is that um, you know we love drinking our older white wines, um, but we wanted to bottle the wine and prepare it and really make it in a way that we thought would last for a very, very long time, just because we think we've got the, we know we've got the grapes and we wanted to, to give that a shot. Um, you'll notice there was a color difference between the 2018 and, and we the 2008. We have about that, yeah. Uh, we do, and uh, a lot of that just comes down to oxygen. Uh, oxygen over time will change the, will slowly, you know, you could go another 100 years and this will be pretty close to brown. Um, I think uh, it, it brings up the whole question of oxidation reduction. And this is the winemaker's dance in many respects, is that um, it, a wine is essentially a collection of, of organic chemicals. When you think about it, everything in here is, is a natural chemical coming from the earth. Uh, and all organic chemicals uh, have uh, sites on them where hydrogen ions are attached. And over time, that's uh, when all the hydrogen ions are attached, that's a reduced wine. And at the end of fermentation, every wine is just tight like this. Uh, but over time, those hydrogen ions will disassociate and oxygen ions will uh, uh, attach in the place where the hydrogen ions have vacated your, your organic chemistry for the day. But this happens on almost every chemical in wine. And this is what aging wine is all about, is this slow transfer of the wine from the very reduced state up over to this point where you're kind of perfectly in balance between your reduced state and your oxidative state. And then slowly over time, the wine will fully oxidize. So the wine is completely oxidized and that will affect everything in wine, the smells, the esters, the aldehydes, all the smells of wine are going through this process, but the color is doing exactly the same thing too. And so the color is really an example of that. So even in a red wine, you see a brickish sort of color coming in time. And this is the natural path of wine. Wine, the grape juice really wants to become wine, but it doesn't want to stay wine. It wants to become something else eventually, uh, just because there's energy in these bond transfers. Um, I may have gotten off the track with organic chemistry a little bit here, but it's, it's interesting. To know it, you know, Dad, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of, uh, direct this in a way to something that you told me a long time ago when we when I was asking you kind of when I first was coming back into the winery um, you know you were talking about Sauvignon Blanc and the way that you hold Sauvignon Blanc in your mind and the way that you think about it because it, it has to be recognized that we we don't ferment Sauvignon Blanc yeast do and what we're really doing is we're microbial wranglers and we're trying to create the right environment for these yeasts and when my dad talks about oxidation and reduction, that's us thinking about this world that the yeast are living in. And you talked about us riding the reductive wave with, with Sauvignon Blanc. And that has to do with how much oxygen you allow to touch the wine at different points in time. And that, that those are some of the crucial decisions about winemaking that um, 
are a little. You bit don't want to freeze the line at a moment of time. You want to. Uh, you want this pack to occur. You just want to slow down and deepen that window of time where it's in the in the zone of, of true enjoyment, like this wine right here. Yeah, I think the the 2008. If you guys get a chance to try it, is at a, a, a pretty ideal stage right now. This is going to be pretty good with some food. Yeah, but I wouldn't wait forever on this wine. I wouldn't. Yeah, we uh, we we did taste a couple of other the older uh, Sauvignon Blancs with various success levels. <laughs> The 2008 turned out to be uh, right. Uh, we promised not to mention that on, <laughs> on, on the camera. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, we do have a question. What do we find with the differences between Napa Sauvignon Blanc versus other regions, uh, for example, New Zealand? And really, that's a lot of, the, you know, my first answer on that is it's really about what New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc is, which is a relatively aggressively uh, grapefruit, cap pea, um, and grassy especially. Uh, the kind of pyrazine character with uh, that we talked a little bit about last week with uh, with Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Sauvignon, Sauvignon Blancs, very highly related varieties. This is the mother of, Sauvi of Cabernet Sauvignon. Mother right? of Cabernet, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon together. Could you explain to me how the bees and the birds come together? Today? Yeah, later, Dad. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, okay. Man, we'll talk about that. Um, <laughs> but Sau Sauvignon Blanc shares some of the characteristics of Cabernet Sauvignon, where it has this tendency to produce these kind of green aromas. I think in New Zealand, you really get a high expression of that kind of pyrazine character. In Napa, we can get that, um, but we do get so much sunshine, we get a, it's a little bit warmer here, that what would you say is kind of the defining characteristic of Napa Sauvignon Blanc, uh, besides being uh, Every other Sauvignon Blanc, not as good as ours. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of anything positive. No. Uh, I, I think the, the, to, to recognize that greenness comes from two places in Sauvignon Blanc. One, it is inherent in the variety. All Sauvignon varieties, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, uh, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, they all are of the same family and they all have a natural level of these methoxypyrazines, which are natural um, insecticides built by the grapevine to repel insects, right? But I think there is also a, a lot of greenness in some of Sauvignon Blancs that come from vigorous growth. We know that the more a vine grows like a weed, the more the wine tastes like a weed, if you will. Green comes from too vigorous of a growth. So what causes vigorous growth? Lots of access to nitrogen, lots of access to water, you know, and, and lots of access to soil, things that allow anything to grow quickly. And that's why I, I think, um, I, I, I think that's why organic farming and uh, farming without irrigation and pruning in the right methods and having these wines in the right soils is fundamental to keeping the herbaceousness that shows up in our wine as being a varietal character as opposed to a, a character that comes from the artifact of growing in too vigorous of a situation. Yeah, and I we're think getting out of here. You know, it, it, it ties into a lot about you know we talked about Rutherford dust a little bit last week, last week with uh, with Cabernet Sauvignon definitely a term more famous with Cabernet Sauvignon, but it plays into Sauvignon Blanc as well, as well, where a lot of it is about the right kind of uh, uh, site selection to begin with. And that really ties into how are these vines going to grow? That, you know, proper site selection, you know, the basic question of what kind of vine do I plant right here? Or do I plant vines at all? Um, that comes down to how, that, how a vine is going to grow in that soil. If you grow a vine in the kind of soil where it's going to become too vigorous, you're going to have all these problems yeah. of, of yeah. just too much. Or if you add, you know, if you're the kind of it becomes a growing problem and it becomes a wine eating problem. Exactly. We have one more special wine to share. We do, and I think it's, uh, you know, this one we, we we're offering the 2008 online, um, and uh, we have a little, just a tiny bit of that left to sell. There is a wine here, Dad, that um, we uh, we unfortunately do not have any to to sell of because it's the first wine that Frog's Leap ever made, the 1981 Sauvignon Blanc, which, uh, Dad, any predictions? Well, so this is 40 years old. This is 40 years old. To give you a little context. We have less This is what the cork looked like coming out. It uh, took a- By the way, if you don't have one of these Durands and, and you're drinking older wines, you're making a huge, huge mistake not to have. This is a combination of an Asso and a, and a Scrupal. And uh, it's a great way to get a cork out. It's really, really the only way to get a cork out of yeah. a bottle that's 40 years old. Yeah. Um, and that I just wanted to taste this with you. And I wanted to kind of so, ask you a, a, a historical question about this. You know, 
we talked a little bit about your respect for Sauvignon Blanc uh, in France, but you could have chosen a lot of grapes in Napa County in 1981 to start Frog's Leap with. There was, Sauvignon Blanc wasn't even that widely planted in Napa at that time. There was more Chenin Blanc and Riesling in Napa in 1981 than there was oh Sauvignon God, Blanc. Rory, try this. This is amazing. <laughs> oh, you would say that. No, it really is amazing. But, but I, mean, I, I, I would love to know that emotionally, but I mean, this is, a, this is an awesome wine. Yeah. Uh, so this is the first wine Frog's Leap ever made, our 81 Sauvignon Blanc. It uh, launched the winery because uh, the New York Times got a bottle of this and wrote it up in a, in a piece, uh, Terry Robards, uh, uh, titled Frog's Leap, a Prince of a Wine. It got picked up by 186 papers across the country and Frog's Leap was off of the races almost unintentionally and it, it's, it hasn't stopped in 40 years. Uh, but this wine is crazy. This wine's got it, Dad. This is really, really cool. I've only ever tasted this wine once, one other time in my life. Um, and uh, I think we only have about six bottles. We only have about six <laughs> bottles of left. If you want to make an offer, uh, uh, we're taking <laughs> offers at a million dollars plus on fro at rivet at frogsleep.com uh, for any of the other bottles. But seriously, we just wanted to- I don't to, think I would sell a bottle of this for a million bucks. This, this is a little bit of a, <laughs> a little bit of a history wine for us. Um, and how would you describe this, Dad? It's almost, it, it's, it's got more of that kind of mushroomy and, and almondy kind of character. Yeah, but the, it still has fruit. Right, it really has fruit, yeah. you know? And, and it's, uh, it's still alive on the palate. I mean, this is crazy. It's you know, crazy. we're getting a lot of questions on how long should we lay down these wines for and what's the, what's the right length of time to age. You know, we're not necessarily recommending that you age Frog's Leap Sauvignon Blanc for 40 years, uh, although we'd love to have this be a demonstration that you can. Well, I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> we aged all but we, we aged all but six bottles less than, the, than these ones. Um, but I think it's it's a testament to the way that we intend to make wine. We talk, you know, if you come here to the winery and you talk with us, um, and, we'll, and we'll talk now, I guess, about what what we intend when we make wine. We're not necessarily saying, hey, you've got to age our Sauvignon Blanc for ten years in order to get everything out of it. And we're not even necessarily saying that about Cabernet Sauvignon, but it is the, we, the way we make wine is, I, I guess the one way to describe it, Dad, is that I wanna be drinking every wine we make for the rest of my life. Yeah. And I want that wine to be at every given point in time, a little bit of an encapsulation. I wanna be able to read that wine along the curve of its life and remember things about when that wine was made. 2008, um, incredible frost year, a uh, very low yielding year um, I've, at our Galleran Vineyard, um, which is where a lot of our uh, Sauvignon Blanc, the majority of our Sauvignon Blanc has grown. We had 30 straight nights of frost uh, in 2008. It was a huge battle. Um, I was off of college, so I had no, nothing to do with it, but uh, I hear stories about it. 2008, um, you know, when you think of, I've, we had three frost nights this week, and I am dog tired. And the, the <laughs> mere thought of 30 straight nights of frost uh, fills me with dread. And so you, you think about all of the work, all of the, the checkups and checking on the frost bands and checking on the sprinklers to make sure to bring this wine to life because without all that work, the wine wouldn't have gotten there. We wouldn't have made the wine. Um, it's kind of cool thinking about that little moment in time. When I think about 2018, the, the the reward for 2017. Really, where it was just to pour me this 81 and let me talk and expect me to talk about any of these other ones. This is just amazing. You know, the, uh, you know this, what this vineyard, where this vineyard, these grapes came from? I don't actually. It's a very famous Cabernet Sauvignon vineyard now. Oh, um, okay. On the west side of Saint Helena. Yeah. So this is the old Spotswood vineyard. This is Spotswood Sauvignon Blanc. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Wow. So anyway, sorry guys, this is flooding me with emotion. You go ahead for a while. <laughs> I, th I think you're getting a little bit of sense of uh, why we make wine. Um, that this, you know, wines like the 1981, which uh, I get to share with my dad, this is the first wine he ever made for Frog Sleep. That I've seen the little card introducing uh, introducing the wine. Yeah. And, hey, if you want to buy a case, come on down to the winery and, and, <laughs> and knock on my door. Um, and to think of everything that. Uh, that Frog Sleep has become and everything that 
you know, you and I know and love and work for every day. And, and hopefully, you know, part of what's fun about sharing it with you guys is, is we want to know from, from you, you know, what was your first encounter with Frog Sleep and, and, and what does that year Share mean to your you? Stories. Yeah. yeah, we, yeah. we kind of want to hear that because it's, uh, wine should be emotional. It should have this kind of connection and have this really specialness to it. Um, for us, it, it's, uh, we live that every day. And so I think part of what we love about doing these tastings is bringing a little bit of that to you guys. Um, and so it, it, that ties into the you know, top rated question here is what is your favorite wine and one of our own and one of another vineyard? But, you know, there, think, are other ones. there are other wines out there. <laughs> choosing one of your own, uh, you know, choosing one of your own wines that's your favorite. It's kind of like choosing your favorite kid, which, which is to say that you know what the answer is, but you're not allowed to tell anybody. Well, it isn't you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's. I think that ties in at least for what our favorite wine of what we make is. There, there are wines that have different levels of emotion and different kind of feelings yeah, to it. I would, I would encourage you, as lovers of wine to kind of put what's the best wine or what's your favorite wine, put those questions aside. I, it, it, I would rather you look for the merit and the beauty and the value in every wine you uh, come across. Find out that wine story, uh, know a little bit about how it was grown, how it was made, uh, the values of the winery and the people who made it. I think that's the joy of wine, not trying to find I mean, these are all 100-point wines, I would think you would agree, right? Yeah, And course, it isn't so much about which is best. Uh, I don't think that's, I think it's not how we should think about wine. I think we should think about their individual personalities and, and how to celebrate those individuals, kind of like with people, you know? Uh, who, who can you say your favorite person is? They yeah. keep, it keeps changing on you, and, and but getting to know them and their personalities is what great wine is all about. So and I, I, I would relax with like, this. It, kind of favorite or which is best or who got the most points or anything like that. Yeah. It's a false. It, 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 you know, that, that really speaks to something. You know, we made the joke last week of having the 100 point signs up for the wine. Obviously, we rate them 100 points. That, I mean, we, wine's not objective that way. And there's a question on here about how, you know, how ratings uh, interact with Frog Sleep. And we've never really just never really participated in, in the whole ratings process. We're happy when somebody gives a high rating to our wine um, because that means that somebody liked our wine. Um, and we find that to be, that's great, you know, no problem with the high rating. We don't exactly get torn up about uh, a low rating either. Well, the idiots that come up with well, that. Yeah. Well, We send them very strongly worded letters. Um, and it's, you know, for us, we just kind of, we think about wine as being a little bit more, uh, uh, a little bit more timeless than ratings, which are really kind of a, just a reflection of uh, wine a trends, moment uh, a moment in time of what, what you know, wine trends and the wine uh, sort of zeitgeist is. For us, we have a, a long version, uh, a long view of how we like to make wine and what my wine means to us that, you know, transcends readings to a, to a certain degree. Um, and uh, so that's, you know, that, that goes to answer the, in a sort of gentle way, uh, the whole, the whole ratings question. You know, we're, we're coming up on an hour here. Uh, for those of you on the, on the live Instagram feed, it's going to cut out. We may uh, take a few questions afterwards uh, that will kick on the live feed again. I want you to pick up a glass, though. Uh, there is an elephant in our room. Uh, you can talk camera, but I think that, uh, look, we're in the, we're in the middle of uh, some extraordinary times, uh, certainly here in the Napa Valley, but across our whole country, across our whole land. And uh, it would go, we'd be remiss in not uh, raising our glass and uh, acknowledging uh, the difficulties that I'm no doubt many of you are going through. Um, these are hard times, um, but you know, something about tasting a 40 year old white wine reminds us that we will, uh, if we're strong, if we come together as a people, as a world, uh, we'll get through this too. And uh, so let's raise our glass and uh, we'll be here next week to uh, have some more fun with you guys and taste some great wines. And we'll stay on for a little bit. We'll stay on for a little bit. Uh, just a quick reminder, uh, we have a new site for the interactive tastings, interactive.frogsleep.com. Um, and that'll have recordings of last week's and this week's tastings and all the future tastings. If you just can't get enough of us, you know, we're, we're flattered. Yeah, yeah, no, we could possibly. <laughs> That's also how to get access to the things like the 2008 Sauvignon Blanc and the 1996 Rutherford that we tasted last week. 
Um, so definitely visit that. We're also going to be throwing up a little bit of extra media. Uh, and, and get yourself one of these. I think they're available online too, the Duran. This is an amazing instrument for uh, opening. But if you don't have that for opening old wines, you're making a big, big mistake. So get one of those. So they're, I they're think kind of pricey. Instagram feed's about to cut out. Um, I haven't drunk enough of these wines. So we're going to take a, we're going to do a little, a little break to drink. Drink and uh, enjoy the wines. We'll be back in just about, in just a few, in a couple minutes. Yeah, isn't that extraordinary? Yeah. Yeah. There's a little trick to this wine, I'll tell you off camera. Oh, yeah. 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 Buy it from somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Wow, they were all good. It's amazing. Oh my God. What an amazing wine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you didn't say that enough. You know? well, no, you can't ever say that enough. <laughs> so uh, hopefully so you guys are back on Instagram and we got, okay, so let's take some questions here. Um, is there a yield difference between Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Sauvignon? Yes, there is. And that goes a lot into what type of soil that they're grown in. Um, Sauvignon Blanc tends to achieve its kind of balance in terms of production and yield anywhere between just about dead even with Cabernet Sauvignon to, you know, 30, 40% higher yield out of Sauvignon Blanc. And that's was really- that, Was that equate to it? Tons per acre. That's I'll somewhere say, between I'll, four to four to seven tons per acre yeah. for for some for our typical Sauvignon Blanc. And Whereas Cabernet three and a half to four. Three to four tons per acre. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And that's um, a function sort of of how long they're grow, going in the growing season. So the more yield that's on a grapevine, uh, the slightly more difficult uh, it is to go long a long time into the into the ripening season. Um, and I think that a lot of it has to do with soils as well. The Cabernet Sauvignon is planted on usually pretty limiting soils, those gravel rich soils that, uh, dry, out. that dry out, that don't support heavy yields for, for a very mm -hmm. long time. Whereas the clay rich soils where, and the, the deep super fertile soils in which we find Sauvignon Blanc and where we plant our Sauvignon Blanc are better suited for a little bit. They, in, in the way that, what I mean when I say better suited is that they find their balance at a slightly higher production per acre than Cabernet Sauvignon. And that varies by block. We've got Sauvignon Blanc blocks that are lower than Cabernet Sauvignon. Namely, the Rachel is actually slightly, uh, can be slightly below that in certain years. And in some years, uh, despite the vines being 40 years old, they just go cowabunga and it's time to, time to party. And they produce, uh, uh, you know, essentially what they produce. We don't go through and thin the I think the it's an important point to talk about Sauvignon Blanc because, um, you know, there's been such a demand for this variety that, I think even producers in Sancerre, there's been such a demand for Sancerre, there's such a demand for Sauvignon Blanc, that the producers are challenged with supply. And so you are kind of forced with a decision, do we meet the demand or do we stay true to our principles of making great wine? And I think that we have seen in Sancerre, and we've certainly seen here, people bringing in grapes from other parts of California to meet the demand, blending up with their Napa grapes, kind of passing that off. We've seen it in Sancerre where uh, yields have gone up. Uh, areas that been traditionally were not planted for Sauvignon Blanc are all of a sudden being planted. Incorporated for into the AOC. And so I think that, uh, um, you know, this is another example of being careful of the values of the winery that you buy from because if they're not dedicated to limiting their production to what is the natural production uh, capacity that, which isn't always a low production. I think there's kind of a false sense that the smaller the yield, the better. That's not always the case. So the wine can become unbalanced in the vineyard if it doesn't have a proper amount of yield, correct? It's true. And, and it's why we talk about balance uh, almost ad nauseum at Frog Sleep is that it really is kind of the critical element, the key word to all of this is where do you find the balance? Sometimes that's low. We have Cabernet Sauvignon uh, blocks that get down towards two tons per acre, and that's where they should be. And we have Cabernet Sauvignon Blancs that are up towards four tons per acre, twice as much production. Does that, you know, what does that mean for how they, how they taste? You know, if they're balanced with that, with that production, that's where they should be. And a lot of the work that we, that, you know, that I do out in the vineyard uh, is walking those blocks and kind of checking them out and saying, hey, it, are these vines balanced? And that's more, that's something that is very difficult to measure. It's very, it's almost, it's impossible to put a number to but instead you're going out there and, and, and using your experience and using your intuition to figure out where that balance is. Balance, 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 balance. balance, balance. balance. So there's a question here about what's a typical day for 
me and what's a typical day for John. <laughs> so, I mean, you, you wake up in your Pacific Heights condo oh, and stop. hop into your helicopter and, you know, <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> and fly over the winery and, and make sure we're, we're... Well, you're a little busier these days than me, I must say. You know, my role has changed a lot at the winery and, uh, you know, we, we are so lucky. We talk about being a winemaker, but obviously our, you know, our team here, Pavel, Paula, Iro, and Jesus, uh, all these, this wonderful team that have been working for us for sometimes 25, 30 years. Uh, but it is so, I mean, I, if I wake up with a itch, Pablo's already scratching that morning. I mean, it, it, we've, been, we've been that close. Uh, uh, and, and so, you know, uh, it's, it's ironic that as a winemaker, you find yourself drawn away from winemaking in some cases to handle the, the vagaries of business. And in these challenging times, I'm spending more time up in my office trying to figure out the hell we're going to do during this uh, 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 crisis right now than I would, but uh, you're still pretty, uh, your day to day is pretty, you're out at the vineyard at 6 to 6 or 30 in the morning every morning. And uh, uh, yeah, it depends. We had a couple of frost nights this week. So Frank and I were out there. Um, Four <laughs> o'clock in the morning. I heard the damn machine come on. Yeah. You, you woke up late then because uh, uh, one night <laughs> it kicked on at one o'clock in the morning. And so that, that, was, that was a fun night. That was my earplug night. <laughs> <laughs> With your noise canceling headphones on. Wow. Um, that's, uh, the, there, there is no typical day in the vineyard that's, uh, except that it involves vines and involves, uh, I think we're also the, almost looking at my arc right here. I, no, no hand touched this wine except my own, you know, by the time we got to 08, I had a pretty good team. And by the time I get to, uh, 2018, I think you were named wine maker in no, the America. No, that's that that bullshit. It's not only out of your mouth ever again. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we had a, you know, a forced retirement party. No, you, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it's, you know, I think this is kind of a perennial question with, uh, with us that is how we decided to go organic and what kind of challenges mm -hmm. and opportunities. And I, I, you know, we, we don't put organic on the label. We could, and we're actually working on doing that, but I think it, uh, we never stopped talking about how we. I, I, I think it would actually be. I would love the chance to have a whole webinar or a whole uh, um, uh, session to talk about what it means to be organic or dry farmed or, or biodynamic or um, beyond biodynamic or regenerative farming. And some of these terms, natural wine, uh, some of these terms that have come on since we. I mean, I mean look, for us, this has been around so long. We've been certified organic for 30 years. We are. You know, we were, uh, so many of these terms, we started, to be honest with you. And and uh, so I think a full discussion, that would be a, a fun webinar. We certainly can't cover it in a few minutes. And it's not a question that we can, um, can really answer in a short period of time. Yeah, so definitely chime in in the comments or, um, you know, I think we have the question, the Q&A and upvote that question. If you're, uh, if you're um, interested in a whole, you know, really it'd have to be a series on that because, there is no, I don't think there is one answer to that question of how it, how we came to farm organically is, yeah. is a long story that goes back to, you know, ideas about farming that really began to reemerge in the 40s and 50s yeah. uh, with Robert Howard, yeah. um, Rachel Carlson, Rachel Mary Carlson, and, and yeah. you know, those are ideas that, that came, that started to materialize in, in concrete form in California uh, in the yeah. 70s and 80s. And then came to kind of our ears down down the road, but that's a whole long history that I think uh, deserves its own little session because yeah. it, it, it's it is so it much is, of who we are. Part of the arc of these ones for sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, <laughs> how did the name Frogsley come come to be? I think I think we can get that off. The, yeah, the we've website. been drinking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In short, we. Uh, we, we lose no opportunity to make fun of our, our Napa Valley neighbors here, including uh, our good friends at Stag's Leap Wine Cellars, uh, which were, the, were blessed with my, with my dad as his first ever job in the Napa, in the Napa Valley. And yeah. So yeah. Um, that, that forms part of that name. Um, what else? We'll we tell got? that story. And it's also, a, it's a great story that's told on our website. And we'll always direct you to our website, which has got a lot of really cool stuff. I think one question we're getting a lot of is, what can we do to help you, John? <laughs> and um, did I no, see that? Over no, there? it's a top question. Yeah, it's a top question. <laughs> and, uh, it, and look, and, and I, I will say this for all wineries right now, wherever you live, uh, this, is a, this is a tough time for wineries. It's a tough time for our partners in this business, our restaurants. Um, and so uh, 
and it's a tough time for you. We, we recognize that it's a tough time for us all, but we, we need support. We, we live right now on the support 60, 70% of our businesses selling to restaurants, which are, are really in tough shape right now. So uh, turn your friends on to our wine and uh, point out that you can, uh, you can uh, buy it off our website and be delivered in a couple of days. And, uh, and we, we can use that support right now, quite frankly. These, these are going to be some, we, we've committed to keeping every one of our employees uh, employed uh, throughout this process. That's a, that's a big commitment. And uh, so support your wineries. This is a good time to see the wineries values. Uh, and we're big believers in that uh, when you enjoy wine, you should consider the values of the wineries that you're supporting uh, very distinctly. And we'll hold ourselves up to that standard in the meantime. So. Yeah, but you know, it's, it's, in, you know, we had a, over 200 and, over 240 of you sign up to, for the zoom tasting today. And I know there are a bunch more of you on Instagram and I just can't tell you, can't tell you how, how awesome it feels to be able to spend this time with you guys and be able to take a few moments out of these eh, crazy moments and, uh, uh, you know, obviously crazy times to be able to share some wine with you all and, and share a little bit about who we are. And uh, we hope that I can't wait to look for, see uh, all the comments and all the t all the discussion about where everybody's from and where they're enjoying and what you're eating with the wine. Because uh, again, we I, as a special it. shout out to my friend Bill Quain and, and Jeannie who uh, <laughs> sent us some uh, several uh, ideas about how we could do be better. We're sorry we didn't pay any attention. <laughs> yeah, we don't. Us, we didn't read any really comments here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so with that, let's raise a glass and thank you guys for joining in uh, one more time. We'll be back next week uh, fighting it out once again. Yeah. Next That's, week we'll be talking about Zinfandel. Oh, so oh it'll God, yeah. be pretty cool. We've got some fun fun wines for that as well. So uh, with that, raise a glass, you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Be well. Stay healthy. Take care of your families, and we'll get all through this together. Cheers. Love you guys.